Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, and it's story time with Uncle Davey by popular demand. Well, in the classical music business, if more than two people demand something, it's popular. So in this case, more than two of you demanded that I do some more readings of various kinds, letters of composers and other things. In this case, we're talking about some historical criticism, some really bad historical criticism, I mean, poorly written and argued and factually, factually deprived. It's absolutely fantastic to look at. You know, every serious critic ought to be a student of history, of history of the profession at the very least. And here we have the review of the New York musical season, 1885 to 1886, by Henry Edward Krebel. Now, Krebel, Krebel was, yeah, I mean, he wasn't a terrible critic. I mean, he wrote a lot and he was, you know, he was capable of changing his mind. And But everyone has their good days and bad days. Performers do, critics do. Critics are performers in a way. We're creators. We're creators of, of literary prose or in this video universe, critical video stuff. And some things are gonna be good and some things aren't gonna be. It's just the way it works. It's human nature, right? And and this is a particularly dreadful piece of writing. He uh, He's reviewing a concert from, let's see, at the Academy of Music in New York in 1885, I think. Um, it says it's January. It just says January. I guess it's 1885. Um, it could be 1886 because it's a January. Yeah, it's a chunk of the way through the book. So anyway, it's the third concert, 44th season of the Philharmonic Society of New York. It's interesting to remember that in 1885, 1880, it must have been 1886 because they started in 1842. So I can do the math. Did I do the math? Yes. You know, the New York Philharmonic and the Vienna Philharmonic are the two oldest orchestras in the world. They both started in 1880, 1842. I know that there are orchestras that say that they go back to like the 14th century in Germany, like the Gewand House and things like that, but it's, it's nonsense. We're talking about regularly constituted continuous public series of performances. And if you go by that definition, you find that 1842 is basically your start date for these things. I mean, the Paris Conservatory Orchestra started in the 1820s playing Beethoven. So, you know, I mean, you can go back further, um, actually a little bit, maybe 10 or 20 years, but that's about as far as you get. Because before that, orchestras were not orchestras. They were aggregations of instruments thrown together for particular events. And those instruments could consist of crumb horns and sack butts and, and tootle, tootle flutes and God knows what else. Anyway, so just, just so we have our history a little bit, little bit lined up, uh, the concert was the Overture to Iphigenie and Aulide by Gluck, um, the Symphony in E-flat, number three by Haydn. Well, what does that mean? It's probably the drum roll, Symphony Number no. 103, um, because the London symphonies were the only ones that were sort of numbered, and, and they were all numbered wrong, but they had numbers, and that's what you played. And then the Schumann Piano Concerto, played by Mr. Carl Felton, and Symphony Number no. 2 in D minor, Opus 70, by Dvorak. Well, Symphony Number no. 2 is the seventh, as we now know, and the conductor was Mr. Theodore Thomas. So here is the atrocious, atrocious piece of writing that, that Krebel came up with. We didn't really talk about the rest of the concert at all. <laughs> he writes, the novelty in this scheme was the Symphony of Dvorak, which was performed in public for the first time at a public rehearsal on the afternoon of the preceding day. It was composed for the Philharmonic Society of London and brought forward under the direction of the composer on April 22nd, 1885. So obviously this is 1886. Its reception in London was enthusiastic. In New York, it was listened to attentively and applauded respectively, respectfully, pardon me, but a deep impression it did not make on either the public or the musicians. What individuality it possesses is derived from the Slavonic tincture apparent in its melodies. The symphony was set down on the program as the second of its composer in conformity with the title of the published score. The designation is only correct with reference in his published works. 
Dvorak's latest biographer, Dr. Joseph Zubati, says that already in 1864, Dvorak had finished two symphonies in his desk. That is true, numbers one and two, as we know them now. This was 11 years before he obtained the artist's stipend from the Austrian government, which enabled him to devote himself exclusively to composition and opened the way for him to, pub, to, pub, opened him to publicity through the kindness of Brahms and Hanslick, who were on the Committee of Awards. Dr. Hanslick, in introducing Dvorak to the Vienna public, related that among the compositions which accompanied the young Bohemian musician's application for the stipend was a symphony. I quote, a symphony, pretty wild and untrammeled, but at the same time so full of talent that Herbeck, then a member of our committee, interested himself warmly for it, unquote. The key of this symphony has not been mentioned. It was probably one in E-flat, composed in 1874. If this surmise, that's number three, by the way, if this surmise is correct, then the so-called second symphony may be Dvorak's fifth. Well, it wasn't. It was the seventh. His two published symphonies are respectfully in D major, opus 60, that's number six. It was brought out in Boston by Mr. Henschel, and D minor, opus 70, this one. It is of record that Dvorak composed a scherzo for a symphony in D minor in 1874. And since such a single movement has never been published, the indications are that the London Philharmonic Society's work was constructed around the movement composed 11 years before. That is errant nonsense. The scherzo, there is no independent scherzo. There's the Fourth Symphony, which has a scherzo. It's in D minor. So, okay, that's nonsense. If so, here we go. The fact is, it, it, the fact is a suggestive commentary on the extent to which success stimulates appreciation and might also serve as an indication that the unknown Dvorak of 11 years ago was a better man than the musical lion of today. For the opinion that the scherzo is vastly superior to the other movements of the D minor symphony is one that is generally acquiesced in by local critics and musicians. Well, what a piece of trash that is. First of all, where where do we begin to unpick this? First of all, I mean, he's totally wrong about the history of the Seventh Symphony. Totally. It does have an unbelievably fabulous scherzo, though, and as we well know. But, I mean, I, I never heard anyone say that the movement is so much better than the rest of the symphony that it dwarfs the rest to insignificance. Um, or that the man that Dvorak was then was better than the Dvorak of, of you know, you know, was, was less, pardon me, than the Dvorak of 11 years previously. There's very little evidence that Krabel even knows the music from, of Dvorak from 11 years previously. It's all reportage. There's no evidence of actual listening. But actual listening in those days was difficult. Let's not forget, there were no recordings. There was no electric stuff. So you couldn't play the music at will. You didn't know what he'd written. You only know what people said about what he'd written. And that informs a lot of criticism. And that's an interesting lesson for all of us because the opinions that have come down to us of a lot of music are based on 19th century sources who we respect because they're old and they're dead and they were supposed to be experts. But these are people who had very, very little opportunity to actually listen to the music they were called upon to discuss. Sometimes they played it at the piano, sometimes they heard it in arrangements, but concerts? Concerts with lots of this music dedicated to one person who was a new composer, as Dvorak was. Remember, his eighth and ninth symphonies, later known as numbers, you know, five and four, four and five. Remember, number five became number three. It, it, those hadn't even been written yet. Nothing, a lot of the great Dvorak that was to come had not even appeared in 1885, 1886, although a lot had, particularly chamber music and operas, but no, he didn't know what he was talking about. He had no clue what he was talking about. And the seventh is often considered to be the greatest of all the Dvorak symphonies. Now, I, you may argue with that, but that it's one of the great big ones. Remember, you also get these CDs, number seven, eight, and nine, all grouped together. So there you have it. Crappy criticism from Henry Crable. It happens to all of us. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.